Yes, sir, I asked. So today's speaker is Professor Rajneesh Kumar, a renowned scientist in the field of gas hydrates and their applications. Professor Rajneesh completed his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering uh, from Pandit Ravi Shankar Shukla University, Raipur, India. He completed his MS in chemical engineering from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India. And uh, uh, he, completed, uh, he completed his PhD in chemical and biological engineering from the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, he worked as a research associate in uh, Stacy Institute for Molecular Sciences Canada. And from 2010 to 2016, he was the senior scientist in uh, chemical engineering and process development department in NCL, Pune, India. From 2016 to 2021, he was the associate professor in department of chemical engineering in IIT Madras. And from 2021 to present, he is the professor in the same department. Coming to his research interests, he is interested in gas hydrates and its application in innovative energy uh, solutions, uh, energy recovery uh, from unconventional uh, resources, carbon dioxide capture and storage, water treatment, purification and desalination. Uh, he has won many awards. Uh, among them, um, in 2016, he won NASI Scopus Young Scientist Award. In 2017, he won a 2017 class of influential researchers invited by uh, Industrial and uh, Engineering uh, Chemistry Research Journal. In 2018, he was the highly uh, cited researcher in engineering uh, as uh, of Clarivet, uh, as uh, uh, done by Clarivet Analytics. In 2020, he won Professor Dr. YBG Verma Award for Teaching Excellence in Chemical Engineering. Uh, uh, he has more than 100 publications uh, with uh, around 8,700 plus citations and a H-index of 47. The title of today's lecture is Gas Hydrate Based Process for CO2 Capture and Sequestration, Molecular Scale to Macro Scale. Sir, I welcome you to deliver the lecture. Thank you. Thanks, Amog. So, uh, I'll start by sharing my screen. Yes, sir. And uh, let's share sound. I don't know whether it will be required, but uh, let's share the sound. No, not now. Uh, yeah. uh, is my screen visible? Yeah, we can see the Zoom screen. Yeah. Uh, now the screen is visible, uh, Professor? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I don't know what I have to do here. Maybe, yeah, it's not visible in other screen. Perfect. So as you have, uh, as Amog rightly said that I'm going to talk about gas hydrates. And uh, my talk is going to be more uh, application oriented, but I would still like to give a little bit of background. Why, if someone talks about CO2 capture, typically uh, what comes to your mind is that you need some solvents, which is amine based or some material like metal organic framework or covalent organic framework, similar material for capture of CO2. And if I'm talking about gas hydrate, so let me first give the importance why gas hydrate based CO2 capture is important. And to uh, put my point, I'll try to basically uh, show a few slides before I actually start talking about the gas hydrates. So let me start with this particular uh, image, which you see here uh, is a chemical plant in China, which basically converts 1,60,000 tons of CO2 or 160,000 tons of CO2 into methanol every year. So what basically it does is that uh, it captures the CO2 from a cement plant, and I believe uh, why they chose cement plant is because uh, cement plant produces CO2 from two different uh, sources. One from the fossil fuel burning itself, which produces CO2 at around 15% concentration. And the other from the calcination of calcium carbonate, which produces almost pure CO2. So if you mix these two stream, you might be able to get a CO2 stream of around 30%. And capturing this CO2 stream is much easier compared to capturing CO2 from say steel industry, which produces CO2 at around 10 to 15% concentration. So the choice of cement industry is mainly to basically reduce the cost of CO2 capture. Now, what they have done is that they have basically, uh, along with the CO2 from cement industry, they mix the CO2 and hydrogen, which comes from a coking furnace nearby. Now coking furnace uh, is basically what they must be doing is that they are uh, uh, gasifying the coke to produce CO2 and hydrogen. So rather than recycling, it's more of a demonstration unit. This is what I understand. But what I will try to point out is that even 160,000 tons of this CO2 uh, utilization 
is only two minutes worth of overall CO2 emission, which basically comes out every year around the world. Uh, so if you, if one has to really convert all the CO2 into chemicals, there will be thousands of such plants which will be essential. So before we go into that, that is what you are trying to see here is CO2 conversion or utilization. But before you actually start converting the CO2, the first step is to capture the CO2. Now, there are two places where, where you can basically capture the CO2, uh, one directly from the air and the other from a point source, which typically are uh, power plants, cement industry, steel industry and all. There are slight differences between these two sources. The source, when you are trying to capture it from the air, the concentration of CO2 is really low in PPM level. And the kind of material which you would need there will has to strongly interact with CO2. Otherwise, it's very difficult for you to capture a very lean concentration of CO2 from air, which uh, uh, is mostly nitrogen. So, uh, but when you are going to point source capture, the concentration of CO2 there, depending upon what industry you are targeting, is still you would not have a concentration beyond 30% of CO2. So uh, power plants, uh, which is coal fired typically in India, or steel industry typically produces a CO2 concentration of around 10 to 15 percent CO2 and remaining can be said that it's either nitrogen or oxygen. One can model it as nitrogen if, they, uh, if one does not worry about the oxygen. So the concern here is that the first step is to capture the CO2 and once you have captured the CO2 then well you can utilize the CO2. So uh, one has to always understand that the limitation of the process is in capture and once you talk about capture there is a huge energy penalty for uh, CO2 capture process. In theory, what uh, people have published and what people accept that there is a capture penalty of around 25% energy penalty. So basically, if you if there is a power plant which produces 400 megawatt of electricity by burning coal, you are basically going to consume 100 megawatt of this 400 megawatt just for the capture of the CO2 which you are producing while you are electric generating that 400 megawatt of electricity. So that one has to always remember that one of the big major challenge for CO2 utilization is not the utilization reaction itself, which could be sustainable, not sustainable in uh, it could be debated, but CO2 capture process has to be sustainable. Because we are talking about in India, we produce around 3.8 billion tons of CO2 every year. We are not talking about billion kilogram of CO2. We are talking about billion tons of CO2. Now, basically, it means we, the process of CO2 capture has to be very sustainable. Nowadays, people use the word green to signify that the process does not produce any CO2. So that's how you talk about green hydrogen. So uh, hydrogen, which is being produced by uh, a method where there is no CO2 emission is called green hydrogen. So with the same terminology, let me explain you what are the challenges when we talk about capturing CO2 by any process. Now, if you talk about most of the chemistry people, they would talk about materials like metal organic framework and uh, covalent organic frameworks and all. And I have just taken a particular uh, recent paper which has come out. And what I wanted to show you, don't have to read whatever is written here. What I wanted to show you is what is now flashing on the screen. You see, whatever material you use, metal organic framework or any other exotic material, the amount of CO2 which you can capture per gram of this material is, uh, based on the literature I see, is roughly 0.2 to 1 gram of CO2 per gram of material. Now, let, let's understand this. If you have to capture 3 billion tons of CO2 per year, what you will have to do basically, you will have to produce 3 billion kilogram of this material, whether it is MOF or whatever you are talking about, 3 billion kilogram of this material. And you should ensure that you should be able to regenerate this material at least 1000 times so that you can capture 3 billion tons of CO2 to become net zero as of today. Tomorrow or five years, 10 years down the line, the CO2 emission in India could be 6 billion tons. So these numbers will obviously go on, will go up, no doubt about it. So it's very important for us to understand if you are going to produce 3 billion kilogram of MOF, you can imagine how much CO2 will emit. That's the first question. The second question, which is very pertinent, is that are you sure that you will be able to recycle this material 1000 times without losing any material? So this is something which people have to ponder about. Moving on, in India, the first carbon capture unit has been put together in a power plant, which is uh, NTPC power plant in Madhya Pradesh, which is called Vindyachal Super Thermal Power Station. 
Now, if you look into this power plant, this is a demonstration unit to capture CO2 coming out from this power plant. And the unit is to demonstrate 20 tons of CO2 capture per day. So they are trying to capture 20 tons of CO2 uh, coming out from that plant per day. That plant alone may produce tons of CO2, maybe million tons of CO2 per day. But the demo unit is to just capture 20 tons of CO2 per day. And the idea, which they have not implemented yet, the idea is to basically ca capture this CO2, mix it with hydrogen to produce 10 tons per day of methanol, a plant similar to what I showed you in the first slide. So that second plant has not come yet. Right now, they are only trying to uh, learn from the CO2 capture part of it. Now, this CO2 capture plant basically relies on amine-based solvents. Okay. Now, what is amine-based solvent? So let me first show you this. The title which I am uh, put over here, that capture of CO2 from flue gases through amine-based solvents has been scaled up. In around the world, multiple places, it has been demonstrated. In India also, there are at least two such large units which are operating currently and people are learning the bottlenecks and uh, whatever comes out from this particular process. Other solutions like uh, MOF, cough, etc. are highly un uh, unsustainable age of today. So we will not talk about that. Now, coming back to what is this CO2 capture? Let me show you the data, uh, the remaining portion of this particular slide. What is a power plant? Power plant basically burns coal in air to produce energy and then it also produces co2 plus nitrogen because you are burning it in an air this is why you have huge amount of nitrogen you burn this coal in excess of air this is why you will have co2 as well as you will also have oxygen which i have omitted here for the time being so basically what do we need we need the energy we don't need anything else but unfortunately along with the energy we get co2 and the nitrogen and this co2 and nitrogen we are emitting to the atmosphere as of now and this is why Basically, the CO2 concentration has gone up to around 500 ppm. I would just put a 500 ppm number. If it is not there yet, it will reach some at some point of time. Now, this is what power plant does. The solution is to capture this CO2 from the mixture of CO2 and nitrogen. Let's make it simple. We'll not bring oxygen here. A simple case is that we have to capture this CO2 from the mixture of CO2 and nitrogen. CO2 comes out at around concentration of 15% CO2 and remaining being nitrogen. Uh, amine based solutions are typically monoethanol amine, diethanol amine, triethanol amine, or a mixture of these three or a derivative of this amine. Ultimately, you will have to use this monoethanol amine, which is written over here. Somehow, this has to react with CO2. It reacts quite well. They interact with each other and it forms some kind of a salt. However, the challenge starts from here. If you are going to cap capture this CO2, billions of tons of this CO2 by this monoethanol amine, the regeneration losses of amine are roughly 2 kilogram per ton of CO2 capture. So the numbers are very simple. If you are going to capture 6 billion, uh, if you are going to capture 3 billion tons of CO2 to become net CO2 zero in India, you are going to waste 6 billion kilogram of NEA, which ultimately will go uh, waste because it cannot be regenerated. Every time this could be uh, uh, regenerated like 100 times would be recycling. And whatever, even you are losing 0.1% of this MEA, by the time you capture one ton of CO2, you lose two kilograms of MEA. So basically, if you are going to capture 3 billion tons of CO2, you are going to lose 3 billion kilogram of MEA. Now, if you are in a business uh, organization, if you are in a boardroom, this looks lucrative because in the boardroom, you can always say, oh, I am going to generate a business of selling 6 billion kilogram of MEA in India. It's a very good opportunity. Let's try to get into this particular business. But let me put you uh, put across this point of sustainability. Now let's say this MEA, I told you the cost, uh, the capture is 25% energy penalty, but I didn't tell you about the cost. The cost is not mentioned over here, but currently the cost of CO2 capture, and this also has been now verified by this uh, carbon capture plant in NTPC in Madhya Pradesh is around 4.65 per kg. Rupees 4.65 per kg of CO2 boy almost comes out to be $50 per ton. Now this $50 per ton, you will have to capture 3 billion tons of CO2. You can imagine what is the cost we are talking about. But even before you start calculating, let me tell you 
that the monoethanol amine which we are using to capture this CO2 is not a green monoethanol amine. Um, and please recall that num uh, the uh, no uh, nomenclature of green is that it does not produce any CO2 while being produced. So the cost of this $50 per ton comes from a monoethanol amine, which itself is not green. Why? Because this monoethanol amine is being produced by ammonia and by ethylene oxide. So we'll have to react these two molecules to produce this monoethanol amine. Now, everyone knows ammonia itself is a very highly CO2, uh, uh, is an energy intensive process. And this is why it releases significantly large amount of CO2. So if you have to get green monoethanol amine, you will have to first produce green ammonia. And I should not be really talking about what is the cost of green ammonia because you know what is the cost of green hydrogen unless and until you produce green hydrogen, you cannot produce green ammonia. Now let's come back to ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide typically is being produced by uh, fossil fuel. There is no other uh, source of ethylene oxide as of today. Now you are saying that I don't want to produce fossil fuel. I don't want to use fossil fuel. Then where you will ethylene oxide is going to come from? Now, if you say that this ethylene oxide will come from biomass, then where is the land to grow that biomass, which will produce so much of ethylene oxide? And we are talking about 6 billion kilogram of monoethanol amine for India alone. You, you can imagine what would be the requirement for the world. So the question is, if today we a monoethanol amine, which cost us $50 per ton, which is not itself a green monoethanol amine, what would be the cost of the capture of CO2 if we start producing green monoethanol amine? Then the other challenge would be that if you can, so this is what I want to say. This is the background which I want to tell you. See, today, if you are saying that I am going to capture CO2 by producing any material, this is a highly unsustainable path. You cannot really make it net CO2 zero, whatever way you want to go for. So the only option for you is to capture CO2 in a material which is already existing. Now, there are not that much material which already exists. One could always look for calcium carbonate, which can be basically dissociated into calcium oxide. And now this calcium oxide can react with CO2 to produce calcium carbonate. This is one approach, but I'm not too sure. I'm not done an analysis, LC analysis of whether this is a better approach compared to MEA or not, but this could be another approach. What I am trying to say here that the third approach or whatever approach which I'm going to talk about today utilizes just water, which exists. You don't have to create any water. So if you are not creating any material, you are you need not have to worry about producing CO2 while creating this particular material, or you need not have to worry about the sustainability aspect of this particular material. Now, when I say water can be used for gas separation or se uh, capture of CO2 from associated gases like nitrogen, I am also saying this, that the water which we need here need not be fresh water. You can use effluent water, which comes from any industry. You can use sea water or saline water, which comes from the sea. So the advantage or the best feature of hydrate process is that it captures CO2 without really uh, having a requirement of utilization of fresh water. This is something which is very important. What are gas hydrates, by the way? Gas hydrates are something which is very, we all of us, we have uh, known about ice and gas hydrates are not very different from ice. They are also hydrogen bonded water molecule, which forms cage like a structure. The only difference here is that each of these cases will have a gas molecule inside. And this is what, this is why we call it a cloth rate, where the gases are the host, uh, the guest, and the water molecule, which forms the case like a structure are the host. All kinds of gases forms hydrate depending upon uh, the size and the um, uh, interaction with water molecule, different, they form hydrate at different temperature and pressure conditions. The other advantage of forming hydrate is that unlike ice, which requires you to form at zero degrees or below zero degrees centigrade, hydrates can form even at room temperature if you have sufficient pressure. So this is the other advantage which you typically have. So you have two knobs here. You have two handles over here. Either you can reduce the temperature to form hydrate or you can increase the pressure to form hydrate. As a chemical engineer, why we like this? Because if you want to do any process out of it, you will have to enhance the kinetics of the process. And one of the easiest way to enhance kinetics of this process is to just go to a higher pressure. And then you can very easily enhance the kinetics of this particular process. But before we go to kinetics, let me show you what exactly we are talking about over here. I This is a very busy slide. I don't want you to focus too much on this slide. I'll give you three points from this particular slide. First point is that if you have a gas dissolve into a liquid, 
A typical mole fraction is 1.1 1 into 10 power minus 3 to 1 into 10 power minus 5, depending upon what gas we are talking about. But as soon as it forms hydrate, the mole fraction is 1 is to 7. 1 is to 7 basically means there is almost 30 weight percent capacity for this gas to be occupied in hydrate phase. So if you have, so this is one very good advantage that the capacity wise, hydrates has very high capacity. Now the next point is that thermo, how does the thermodynamics looks? So if you see here, this, this uh, circles, which is black dots, and then you see these rectangular dots over here, these black dots are phase diagram for pure CO2 hydrate. So at 10 degrees centigrade, you need roughly 30, 40 bar pressure for pure CO2 hydrate to form. Whereas at 10 degree centigrade, you need roughly 300 bar pressure for nitrogen hydrate to form. So now if you have a mixture of CO2 and nitrogen, and you are at a pressure which is below this 30, 30, uh, 300 bar, there is a chance that you will be able to form hydrate. And when such hydrate forms, it's only the CO2 molecule or mostly the CO2 molecule which will occupy the hydrate phase. And nitrogen would not like to participate in this hydrate phase because nitrogen does not like to form hydrate at a pressure which is below 300 bar. So this is another advantage you have over here from the phase diagram of these two molecules. And this typically basically comes from the size of the molecule itself. The other advantage we are talking about of hydrate, it's not a uniform size caged here, cages over here. Depending upon the size of the guest molecule, your structure could be a structure one, a structure two, or a structure H. These three are the structures which you can really form easily in the lab. There are 10 other structures which form, but I don't want to talk about it. These are the structures which forms at moderate conditions and have the potential for a scale up. So we are only going to talk about those things which have potential for a scale up. So in this particular case, you see there are some small kg, there are some large cages in a structure one. In a structure two, the large cage of a structure two even is even in size is larger than the large cage of a structure one. And there is also a structure H where the large cage is very much bigger than the large cage of a structure one. What we have seen that a molecule which is larger in size, for example, you're talking about a molecule like propane forms a structure two hydrate at a very mild condition. Or there are molecules like tetrahydrofluoron, which forms a structure two hydrate at a very mild condition. And I'll tell you what is the mild condition. THF, that is tetrahydrofluoron hydrate, forms hydrate at four degrees centigrade and atmospheric pressure. So you don't have to go to any pressure. And even if you are at four degrees centigrade, THF and water, when you mix together, will form ice-like hydrates of THF. So what exactly we propose here that you add a, a small amount of THF in water, bring the phase diagram of this crystallization. And once that is happening, you expose this mixture to a CO2 and nitrogen mixture. Typically, since CO2 likes to form hydrate at a much milder conditions compared to nitrogen, CO2 will occupy the hydrate phase and nitrogen will not occupy the hydrate phase. So this is the kind of scenario which is being talked over here. So what we are basically doing, if you have a mixture of CO2 and nitrogen and you allow it to come in contact with water or a water THF mixture, from the gas phase, CO2 will like to form this kind of solid hydrate phase. So what typically is now what you are trying to do is that when you have a gas mixture of CO2 and nitrogen in the gas phase, which is 15% CO2 and say 85% nitrogen, once hydrate forms, you are going to have a solid hydrate crystals, which is enriched in CO2, and you are going to have a gas phase, which is depleted in CO2. Now, I'll show you one more data over here. Here we are starting with a 10% CO2 concentration. And if you are trying to form hydrate from a 10% CO2 concentration in the gas phase, once hydrate crystallizes, the composition of CO2 in the hydrate phase is roughly 50%. And then you are basically, you can dissociate this hydrate, which can dissociate very easily just by releasing the pressure because now it is below the phase diagram and it should automatically dissociate thermodynamically. So you can basically use this new gas mixture, which is roughly 50% CO2 to form the to form hydrate again from this gas mixture. And once this gas mixture forms hydrate, you are close to 90% CO2 in the hydrate phase. So what basically you have done, or for example, if you start from 15% or 16% of CO2, in two stages, you will be able to basically produce 95% CO2. So effectively what you have done, you have taken 15% CO2 gas phase 
an 85% nitrogen uh, system and you have basically converted into 95% CO2 and 5% nitrogen system. So this is exactly what we want. If you are going to form hydrate from 15% CO2 and 85% nitrogen system, in the gas phase, you will have roughly 5% CO2 and 95% nitrogen, which you can release into the atmosphere. You have already reduced the concentration of CO2 from 15-17% to 4-5%. That's very good. That's good enough. From the hydrate phase, what you are going to get? You are going to get 95% CO2 and 5% nitrogen. You can sequester this 95% CO2 and 9% nitrogen in under the seabed because now you have primarily CO2. This basically allows you to reduce the cost of CO2 separation significantly. You are much more sustainable because you are not using any other chemical other than water. And the biggest advantage of this particular process is that since there is no chemical reaction between water and CO2, you will be regenerating all your water which you have started with. So as soon as you dissociate the hydrate, you will basically regenerate all your water and then you can reuse the water or whatever THF you have used it to start with for your next operation. All the data has been done for energy penalty and all and it looks pretty good. I don't want to go in detail. But before you do all this, obviously you'll have to optimize this particular process and optimization of such process requires significant effort. And you will have to basically study these hydrates at molecular level. So what basically you do is that you form the hydrate, harvest this hydrate at liquid nitrogen temperature and do different kind of spectroscopy analysis on this hydrate to know exactly where CO2, CO2 is going, where nitrogen is going, or high, how I should be able to improve the separation efficiency of these processes. So all this has to be looked into. You can basically do uh, solid state NMR on the solid hydrate phase to basically know exactly where CO2s are going, whether it's in the small cage or the large cage, whether it's in the small cage or the large cage of a structure two or a structure one, or whether CO2 likes to form a structure H hydrate or not. For example, you can do powder X-ray diffraction to understand what are the structure which is basically forming. For uh, You can do a proper powder X-ray diffraction at whatever temperature you want, at few megapascal pressure, depending upon if you have a high pressure powder, uh, powder X-ray diffraction. You should be able to use Raman spectroscopy to actually analyze the hydrates very easily to know exactly whether CO2 is part of the hydrate. If it is part of the hydrate, which cages actually these uh, CO2 is, are occupying. You can tweak this particular process by adding certain additives. And then you know exactly what condition you will be able to get a better separation efficiency between CO2 and nitrogen. So all such studies can be done. For example, in this particular case, I will show you a case study of CO2 and hydrogen mixture. Now, where why CO2 and hydrogen is important? If you are going to gasify coal to produce electricity rather than combusting coal to produce electricity, ultimately, you can basically do a shift reaction to produce a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen. The advantage of producing CO2 and hydrogen and electricity is, is that, that the concentration of CO2 in this case is much higher and it's much easier for you to capture the CO2. So this is one of the one uh, st case study for a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen where roughly 40% CO2 is there, 60% hydrogen is there. And how do you separate these two gases by forming hydrate? Now CO2 is obviously larger in size, hydrogen is a smaller in size. But if you look at the phase diagram, CO2 forms hydrate at much milder conditions and hydrogen form hydrate at a uh, very high pressure condition. Further, pure hydrogen likes to form a structure 2 hydrate. There are reasons why it would form a structure 2 hydrate, but today I'm not going to focus on that. And CO2 likes to form a structure 1 hydrate. So when you are using a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen, the first question comes to your mind, whether it is a structure 1 or a structure 2, which we are forming. So that you can basically very easily determine by a powder X-ray diffraction, whether you are forming a structure one or a structure two. Why it is important? I'll tell you why it is important. You see in a structure one, there are six large cages and two small cages. These are cages made up of water molecule. So if I form a structure one hydrate by forming a hydrate of CO2 and hydrogen, I see that CO2 will occupy all the large cages of this structure one hydrate and it might like to occupy some of the small cages of this structure one hybrid. Since CO2 is large in size, you don't know whether it will like to occupy the small cages of a structure one hybrid or it would like to occupy the small cage of a structure two hybrid. But there is a slight difference in the size of these two cages. Further, in a structure two hybrid, you see there are large number of a small cages compared to large cages. So the, the 
the reason why you should be interested in whether these mixtures are forming a structure one or a structure two is primarily because of the separation efficiency of the process. Also, because kinetics of formation of a structure one hydrate could be very different from the formation of a structure two hydrate. And since my process requires me to form and dissociate hydrate, I need to worry about kinetics of hydrate formation as well as kinetics of hydrate dissociation. Because if these two does not match, then it would be difficult for me to basically make it a continuous process. So this is the reason why I would like to understand what structure it forms. When you are trying to form a mixture of hydrate from a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen, we saw that primarily it forms a structure one hydrate but it forms a structure one hydrate at a very high pressure. And if it is forming a structure one hydrate at very high pressure, even though the separation efficiency is good, I may not be able to scale up because industry would say, no, no, I am not interested in a process which runs at 70, 80 bar. I want a process which runs at 30, 40 bar. So this is where we basically started looking into adding certain small amount of additives. For example, you can use THF as I was telling you. You can also use propane. It's a very good, uh, uh, why I have used propane here, I'll tell you, I'll give you the reason. Typically, when you are trying to gasify coal to produce carbon dioxide and hydrogen, you also produce a small amount of hydrogen sulfide because there is some sulfur content in coal. Now, if you cannot do an experiment with hydrogen sulfide because of the safety protocols in the lab, the best way to do experiment with a similar gas which forms hydrate at a similar temperature and pressure conditions as hydrogen sulfide. And this is why we basically chose propane as the model system instead of hydrogen sulfide to basically study the kinetics and the thermodynamics of this particular system. So now what, what we did, we basically added a small amount of propane in this particular system and we studied this hydrate at different pressure at 4.8 megapascal and 3.8 megapascal around 30 to 40 bar where industries are more comfortable with. Sorry, when we, why we are doing at 30, 40 bar? Because the CO2 and hydrogen mixture, which comes out from a sifted synthesis reactor are typically available at around 50 bar. So if I am having a gas mixture of CO2 and hydrogen, which is available at 50 bar, and if I'm running a process at 50 bar, no industry would be able to, no one would complain why we are working at, uh, working at higher pressure. So this is the reason why we basically look into some of these, uh, processes at around 30 to 40 bar or 40 to 50 bar, depending upon the requirement of the industry. Now, the next problem was, now we know it forms a structure one or a structure two, but we really don't know where the CO2 is going, whether CO2 is going, if it forms a structure one, whether CO2 is only occupying the large cages or it is also occupying the small cages or for that matter, where nitrogen is going, whether nitrogen is occupying the large cages or small cages. So because part of some of the nitrogen will also go in the hydrate phase, then this is why I uh, gave you this data that if you start with 15% of CO2 in the gas phase, in the hydrate phase, you will roughly reach around 60-70% of uh, CO2. Remaining would be nitrogen or hydrogen in there. So it basically means that you will have to somehow improve the separation efficiency of this process by tweaking the structure or by tweaking the temperature and pressure you form this particular hydrate so that the other gas does not really occupy the hydrate phase. So one of the easiest way to analyze which cages hydrate actually has, uh, the molecules have been, uh, have occupied in a hydrate phase is by Raman spectroscopy because Raman spectroscopy is more easily available. You can easily do a solid state uh, Raman spectroscopy or on the hydrate phase, which has been cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature. In minutes, you basically get a lot of information, which for, uh, if you have to do a magic angle spinning uh, NMR, it will take a lot of effort and also you require very specialized set of equipment. So if I can do something very similar, what NMR gives me by a Raman spectroscopy, it will be very easy, use, useful for me. So what we basically started with, we saw that for methane hydrate, you get very nice two separate peaks. And each of these peaks basically demonstrate presence of methane in the large cages and in, and in the small cages. The ratio under the peak also tells you how much methane is present in the large cage and how much methane is present in the small cage. Whether it forms a structure one or a structure two, you might still be able to basically determine methane occupancy in the small or large cages by Raman spectroscopy. And we have basically uh, proved it that it can be very easily be determined if you have another method or another uh, technique by which you can basically get the composition of the hydrate phase. For example, you can do a gas chromatographic analysis on the gases uh, obtained by dissociation of a hydrate. So once you combine these two information, you can pinpointedly you know exactly how much methane was present in the large cage and how much methane was present in the small cage. 
or for that matter how much propane was present in a small cage or how much propane was whether propane occupied the uh, all the large cages or not propane cannot go into the small cages of a structure too so that, that's something which uh, is known however when you do something similar for co2 it does not basically gets a split uh, does not split into two cages for example when methane was present in the large cage you had a separate peak when methane was present in the small cage you had two separate peaks for these two but when you do something similar for CO2 and you do a Raman, you don't get it. CO2 hydrogen, we saw forms a structure one hydrate, gives one peak over here. CO2 hydrogen propane, which forms a structure two hydrate, also gives you one peak over here. And there is no splitting of this peak. So you really don't know whether CO2 has gone into the small cages or in the large cages. And same is the problem with NMR. Your NMR also does not show you. There is a broadening of peak in CO2 hydrogen and propane case, but really does not, you does not really get an information, quantitative information after analyzing the hydrate phase, whether CO2 is present in the large cage or CO2 is present in the small cage, you get a data which tells you CO2 is present and how much CO2 is present, but you really don't know how much CO2 is going into the large and how much CO2 is going into the small cages. And this is why when we basically went into IR spectroscopy, we did a lot of work on IR spectroscopy. And in this particular case, we could identify CO2 being present in the large cages as well as the small cages, and it gives you two split peaks. And from here, we figured out, see, there is a small uh, data which I would like to discuss over here. When we talk about a form, a hydrate of CO2, hydrogen, and propane, or CO2, hydrogen, and hydrogen sulfide, all the three gases occupy the hydrate phase. So if all the three gases occupy the hydrate phase, and if there is a large cage and a small cage, if this propane was not present, all the CO2 would have gone into the large cage. So I would have got a better separation efficiency between CO2 and hydrogen. Theoretically, this is what is expected because now since propane or hydrogen sulfide is also occupying the large cages, my separation efficiency between CO2 and hydrogen reduces because part of the large cages are now occupied by propane. So only part of the large cages will be occupied by CO2. However, we, uh, we got some really interesting result. What we saw that when you are trying to form CO2 hydrogen and propane or CO2 hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide hydrate, and when it forms a structure too, lot of CO2 actually occupies the small cages also. Whereas when CO2 hydrogen forms a structure one hydrate, the small amount of CO2 is basically occupy the small cages and primarily small cages are occupied by hydrogen. So this was a very interesting information we found and that basically improved the separation efficiency. It, it reduced the pressure at which this operation can be done. And from there, we basically identified that this could be a process by which you can basically separate a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen. Now I'm going too fast, I know. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have been given some uh, time. I want to finish few other stuff. I'll try to uh, go here. I'll give you a small data on other uh, case study where you have to separate a mixture of CO2 and methane. Now CO2 and methane mixture typically comes out from bio units, biogas unit and all. There is a requirement where you, you have to separate CO2 from methane so that you can enrich the concentration of methane and it would be much more value addition if you are basically trying to produce CO2, uh, uh, you are trying to produce methane from any bioprocesses. So we have seen here that if you are trying to form hydrate of CO2 and methane, you should form a structure H hydrate. Because when you form a structure H hydrate, CO2 does not like to go into any of the cages, neither the small cage, not the medium cage, or not the, lar la not the largest cage. And this, date, this experiment was done with high pressure powder extra, XRD with a beryllium window in situ analysis to basically know exactly where CO2 will, what kind of a structure form and where CO2 is actually occupying. Whether when CO2 is, and we found that when CO2 is present in at a concentration of 10% or beyond 10%, you basically does not form a structure H hydrate. Either you will form a structure one hydrate or a structure two hydrate. So basically it tells you that if you can somehow form a structure H hydrated by this mixture and we have formed it, you know that CO2 will not participate in hydrate formation and the hydrates will only have methane in it. So if you can form a hydrate with a mixture of CO2 and methane where only, only hydrate uh, occupies, uh, CO methane only goes into the hydrate phase, your gas phase will be primarily CO2 and you will be able to basically separate these two gases. And again, as I was telling you, you can do all this at a very mild temperature and a pressure which is not too high, 30, 40 bar pressure, which is acceptable in industry. Now, this is the thermodynamics part or the structure information which you get. 
But if you have to scale up such operations, you'll have to basically worry about what we in chemical engineering call Hata number. You basically have to worry about the mass transfer limitation. You worry, you have to worry about the kinetics of the process. And since I'm running out of time, I would like to skip some of this slide. Here, you can basically form hydrates uh, very easily in the lab, which sometime, which would look like this. You see, huge amount of hydrate has grown in this particular. And each of these uh, crystals have large amount of CO2 in it. So we have basically demonstrated this uh, at a large scale. What we are trying to do here, you feed in a gas mixture from this end. And then by the time this gas mixture comes out from here, you have almost pure CO2 uh, nitrogen coming out of it. So if you are feeding a CO2 and nitrogen mixture, 30% CO2 and 70% nitrogen, by the time this gas comes out from here, and it is here the hydrates are forming. This is how the hydrates are forming on the uh, bed, what you see over there. The gas which comes out is pure nitrogen, almost 95% uh, nitrogen. And you can basically emit it to the atmosphere because you have already reduced the concentration of CO2 from 30% to almost 5%. We have looked into the kinetics of the process. We have identified multiple material, multiple additives, which basically enhances the hydrate formation kinetics. Within minutes, you will be able to basically convert all your water into hydrate. So some of these work which we have done, uh, where we we want to do a lot of a scale up. Obviously, while we do a scale up, we, we do not lose focus on doing fundamental research. For example, when we are talking about, we saw in one case that if you are using a, a packing material, large amount of hydrate forms. So we thought, okay, the easiest pack, packing material could be silica sand. And when we form silica sand hydrate, we see around 60% water gets converted into hydrate. Now, as a chemical engineer, people will tell you if there is a natural convection of CO2 from this, this is where the CO2 is, and this is where the sand bed is with some water in it. If you just rely on natural convection, this is what we rely on over here. We just expose this uh, entire reactor to CO2. It would take days for the CO2 to go from here to here. But when it's hydrates start forming, you will not believe it happens within an hour or two hours. So we did MRI. We, we started doing MRI in a, a sapphire reactor to understand where hydrates form, whether it's forming only on the interface or hydrate also forms at the bottom of this particular reactor. So I would like to skip some of this data, but it matters what is the material of construction which you are using over here. Because depending upon the material of the construction, you will see CO2 will basically pass on from the walls of this particular reactor also. So some of these analysis basically gives you a lot of information, what kind of reactor design you have to do, what kind of material of construction you'll have to use for the reactor design. And then we, as I was telling you, you have to also rely on certain additives, which will basically bring crystal defects. When you form crystals with defects, it grows, or in other words, when you form hydrates at a very fast rate, it, it creates a lot of crystal defects. Can I use uh, defects of this particular crystal to enhance the rate of hydrate dissociation? Because if, I, if you recall what the process which I have where hydrate formation is one and we have to also dissociate the hydrate. So we do a lot of such uh, work and ultimately this is the demonstration unit which you see over here. So since I have been given only 40 minutes to 45 minutes, I think I have run out of my time. Uh, similar... can, you, can you go back to the previous thing and then talk about that, what you have done? Yeah, thank you. So you see here, you have a reactor over here. This is a, a continuous reactor where you have water. This is where the hydrate basically uh, grows in my reactor. This is where I have a gas, uh, which is basically supplied to form the hydrate. And then when I am dissociating the hydrate, this is where I, my uh, gas is being collected. So what I do, I basically have a bed over here of uh, any packing material. And you saw that multi-bed kind of approach. We have multi-bed kind of approach because you cannot use a packing, a packed bed approach uh, where uh, there is a conversion of a gas and liquid into solid. Otherwise, your bed, uh, the bed will be packed and you will have a huge, a large amount of pressure drop. So you cannot make it a continuous uh, process. To make it a continuous process, we have a multi-bed approach. There are multiple bed over here. Ga liquid water is supplied. Now the gas is supplied from here and then gas forms hydrate. And whatever gas which is coming out is collected over here. We can You measure the concentration of this gas you measure the concentration of this gas all in real time to figure out what is the kinetics of this particular process, how long it will take for this CO2 nitrogen mixture to form hydrate. And if you look into this particular approach over here, if I can make a vertical bed with multiple bed, I can handle any kind of flow rate. If the flow rate is very high, I will have multiple more beds vertically stacked. 
If the flow rate is small, I will have a smaller size. I'm not occupying the real estate in any industry. I can vertically go up like a tray tower. So some of these things which we have done for CO2 capture, CO2 sequestration, unfortunately, I do not have time. So I will talk about, I'll not talk about it today, but we have a demonstration unit for CO2 sequestration also, where we demonstrate how CO2 could be sequestered effectively under the sea, 100 meters to 300, 400 meters below the seabed. And uh, the kinetics are very fast. What are the capacity uh, we have in, uh, in India? We have a lot of other uh, pilot plant activities going around using hydrate for water purification, for storage of uh, uh, energy as coal hydrate. Uh, this is one of the demo units at large scale we have demonstrated for direct air capture of CO2. So these are some of the processes which we do. And since I have run out of time, I would stop over here. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, sorry, I have gone really fast, but I hope uh, you will be able to understand part of whatever I discussed. Thank you. So you looked at largely from the perspective of uh, an engineer. Um, of course, some basic science also came out of uh, in that process. If you start looking at this, um, one important aspect is, is also energy. So you require energy to pull water or, or to create. Um, so now you dissociate, uh, you also get, you could probably recover some energy. Yes. What are the thoughts in that uh, regard? Yeah, we have, uh, this is a very nice question, uh, Professor Pradeep. We have also uh, done a proper uh, utility optimization. There are two aspects which I would like to talk to you about uh, on this particular aspect. Uh, there is a large amount of cold energy available in India, especially why we have this cold energy, because we import 80 metri million metric ton of liquefied natural gas, LNG. These natural gas are ultimately going to replace some of our coal-fired power plant, because if you are going to produce electricity by natural gas, you cut down your CO2 emission by at least 70%. So there are huge amount of this cold energy available to us. And if you can integrate this gas added based process with the cold energy, which is going to utilize uh, the LNG, which is going to be uh, used for power, uh, power generation and the cold energy, which is going to be used for running a gas added based process for CO2 capture, you are basically talking about a process which basically is not net energy intensive. It does not take any energy. Otherwise this cold energy is anyway is being wasted. So if you were to combine this uh, CO, uh, gas hydrates as a major source of CO2 after it is captured, now it is um, nearly 100% of CO2, CO2 that you will have after dissociation. To combine that uh, with catalysis for methanol production, is there some activity in that direction from coal power plant or whatever plant to hydrates the two catalysis and methanol. Uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, important question. And as, as you have rightly said, ultimately, whatever CO2 you are capturing, there are two ways you are going to handle it. Either you utilize this CO2 into some chemical or you sequester this CO2 into under the seabed. One of the challenge which I always face and which I have always talked about in my presentations are that the amount of CO2 which you basically produce every day is humongous. You cannot basically utilize all your CO2 which you are producing. Our energy demand is huge. At max, what you can basically utilize is going to be maximum 10 to 15% of CO2 which you are producing. So I always like to tell this that you cannot ignore sequestration. If you are saying that you can utilize all your CO2, this is not the real case scenario. The real case scenario is that you will have to pay money to sequester CO2. Now, coming back to your question of CO2 utilization into methanol or dimethyl ether, uh, there is a, a recent call, uh, DST call for converting CO2 into methanol or dimethyl ether. These two are very good uh, processes and hydrate pro, uh, can give you, nine. why 95%? I can give you 99.5% CO2. That's not a problem at all. Obviously, I cannot give you 100% CO2 because there you need policing approach and we are talking about a physical process. I can give you 99% CO2 and you can convert it into dimethyl ether or methanol. But please be aware that you would need green hydrogen for that. And I'm not too sure whether if you really have green hydrogen, why I would like to convert, mix it with CO2 to produce a chemical uh, out of it. But uh, yeah, if that is what is required, you can certainly do it. 
I will, um, you know, uh, I would like to say that maybe you should start thinking about this process because this is how chemistry has expanded tremendously in catalysis uh, to give you. Um, so, Pradeep, we order. are working on CO2 utilization also. Uh, in fact, what I wanted to say was that there is a lot of solid state chemistry, uh, computation, science, and all that thing. Now, you. Uh, your expertise and your scale up and all that is 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 also a tremendous amount of work. So looking at these two aspects, of course, uh, combining the benefits of both these, uh, one should probably think in terms of a plan. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly, and we are working on that plan, Professor Pradeep. We are working. We are work going, uh, working on CO two utilization in multiple aspects. For example, we are trying to basically utilize CO two through polymerization route. So good, very good. I, I will come back to you on this uh, later, but there may be other questions. Yeah, thank you. Sure, sir. Maybe if I can. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I mean, just uh, to, to that point of using CO2 uh, later again. I mean, you mentioned about the billions of tons. So the, my question would be how much of these chemicals do we really need? Uh, if you would like to use CO2, or what fraction of the CO2 which we produce today, we could convert into something useful for chemical industry. I would think that even with the large numbers and, and production rates and quantities of, of chemical industry, it would still be a small fraction of the CO2. Is I completely correct? agree most... with that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, so most if of... we... Yeah, sorry, please go ahead. Sorry. Most of it has to be stored. Exactly. And this is what I was also trying to answer to Professor Pradeep, that assuming today we have a robust process for converting CO2 into methanol or dimethyl ether or any other such chemical, assuming we have a well-developed mature process, but if you convert maximum, whatever you require, if you'd like to convert, it would be hardly 10% of total CO2 which you are emitting to. Right. So 90% of CO2 is have to be sequestered. There is no way out. And as an engineer, I always try to point it out to everyone that it's good to talk about CO2 sequestration and pains me. Why it pains me, I'll tell you. Entire world, the entire chemistry fraternity only talks about CO2 utilization. Billions of dollars is being invested on research on CO2 utilization. Not even a fraction of that money goes into research on CO2 sequestration. And this is something which is very important. And I always try to tell this to the chemistry fraternity that utilization is good, no doubt about it. But then mm -hmm. the sustainability aspect of utilization is questionable. I don't want to talk about it today, but at some other point of time, I'll talk about it. Because as I talked about the chemistry of CO2 capture, you could very well guess what is the sustainability aspect of CO2 capture by a chemical reaction. When we talk about monoethanol amine or diethanol amine or triethanol amine, there also we are talking about a chemical reaction. And you see what is the sustainability of that particular reaction. We have to always bring out this sustainability aspect. I didn't even talk about the water consumption in uh, MEA, pro the capture by MEA process. Every kilogram of MEA which we regenerate, two kilograms of water get wasted. Two mm -hmm. kilograms of water. Mm -hmm. Can you believe we need billions of kilograms of water? We, where we will get all this water from? And these are fresh water I'm talking about. It's not seawater which I talked about in the hydrate. So mm -hmm. as soon as you talk about a chemical reaction, I do agree that we have to do research and advance and all, but sustainability aspect has to be questioned because ultimately we are talking about net zero CO2 that we should right. not follow. All right, thank you. Uh, you have a question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a very simple question. Uh, you mentioned that you, we can use any kind of water to capture CO2. Uh, uh, is the effect of pH value of water negligible small? Uh, very nice question, Tatsuya. So I uh, I have uh, I will tell you we have done effluent treatment also. For example, the plant which you see here mm. is to treat effluent of a uh, oil and gas industry and produce pure water. So here mm. we are taking acidic water as well as basic water. We convert this water into hydrates. And hydrates, since only con consist of hydrogen bonded water molecule, if you can separate out the solid hydrate out of this mother liquor, you are basically purifying the water. So the plant which you see over here is exactly for that. 
and we have done uh, entire kinetics thermodynamic analysis to mm -hmm. prove that either it is acidic water or it is basic water or it is saline water the only requirement you have is slightly higher pressure nothing more than that if you mm -hmm. can instead of working at 30 bar pressure you'll have to work at 35 bar pressure mm -hmm. there is no uh, deactivation because there is no catalyst there is no reaction there is no other effect you have to just increase the pressure by five bar and in this particular uh, process which i am showing you over here the image which you currently see on the screen is ultimately going to replace reverse osmosis which is also going to run at around 40 bar, 45 bar this is a much more energy intensive process uh, uh, much less energy intensive process compared to reverse osmosis okay thank you thank you very much thank you so what does it mean by um, you know it will replace uh, what will happen to the salt the salt will ultimately if you are talking about salt salt will ultimately have to be remain in the water ro also does the same thing it yeah, yeah. it converts a fraction of water into a fraction of water which has much higher concentration of salt and a fraction of water which has much lower concentration of salt. We are doing the same process. This is why I say I'm going to replace RO process. I'm not uh, replacing any other process. Thank you. Thomas? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. I'm always impressed by, uh, by this kind of talk. And Rainish, I do remember your talk from, uh, from when I visited to India last year. Uh, Thank you. I, although I have sometimes difficulties when looking at the big numbers it's like uh, somehow pondering the distance when you listen to a talk of an astrophysicist so <laughs> uh, i'm i'm a i'm a chemist that were in the lab and uh, so the quantities are of course completely uncomparable to the quantities of uh, of chemicals you talk about but uh, when I'm trying to somehow orientate myself, to find myself in, in this research, what comes out as clear message, uh, and I might be wrong or right, I would like you to sort of uh, clear it for me, is that kind of sequestration or hiding CO2 in the, the ocean bed seems as the only kind of solution uh, to tackle the problem of CO2 and how we are changing the atmosphere by burning coal, etc., etc., Because all the other applications, all the other reprocessing, turning carbon dioxide into something useful like methanol, especially at the very beginning of your talk when you mentioned the, the, the Chinese plant, which uh, turns CO2 into methanol. And the amount of CO2 that it turns is equivalent to two minutes of our production per year. It means it's negligible, even though I can see the economical benefit of that process. But what is the, the economical benefit of uh, storing CO2 in the ocean floor? Very right. Very pertinent question, Thomas. And I really appreciate you ask this question. I, I have been trying to argue this aspect that whether there is an economic benefit or no, can you get away without sequestering the CO2? There is the, the answer is that there is no other option. What yeah. you are going to do otherwise? See, you are producing huge amount of CO2. This is a reality. And we are not going to go down from here. And I'm telling you, data of India, last two years, because there was COVID and coronavirus, the CO2 emission came down. But this year, again, it went up. There is an increase of 5% to 6% every year. And I'll tell you, with global warming and all, and better lifestyle in India, the CO2 emission in India is going to go at 6% per year. Now we talk about 6% per year. In 10 years' time, we are talking about 6 billion tons. Yes. So the yeah. challenge is very, it's a, it's a massive challenge. People don't realize it. It's a challenge. This is why most of the government have no idea what they should be doing. So they give a number which is too far in future. So US says that we will do by 2050. China adds 10 years in that and say that we will do it by 2060. India was smart enough to add another 10 years to say that we will do it by 2070. But the point yeah. is, there is no clear cut answer uh, anyone has. What you are going to do? People may tell you that we will go to solar and all. And I'll tell you, I'll give you some more number. 
See, if you are producing one kilowatt of electricity by burning coal, you produce 800 gram of CO2. The best process you produce 800 gram of CO2. And you know how much you will produce, uh, uh, how much CO2 will produce if you are doing it by solar panel? You are going to produce still 200 and 250 gram of CO2 if you convert all your power plant uh, coal from a solar panel based. I'm not sure when it can be done. But the question is that when wherever it can be done, you are only cutting down your CO2 emission by one fourth. It's not going to zero. Yes. So yeah. the solution has to be found. And probably when in 2070, when this uh, most of the power plant is converted into a uh, solar based power plant, at that point of time, all the CO2 to DME and CO2 to methanol will start appearing more lucrative because you have only one fourth the capacity of CO2 which you are generating today. So those technology will become more relevant at that point of time. As of today, the only way to basically become CO2 neutral or net zero by 2070 or 2050 is to sequester most of the CO2 under the 100, 300 meters under the seabed, or there are many other saline, saline aquifers are there. Are there In India, there is around 300 to 600 billion tons capacity. So the point I am trying to make is that there are ways, it will cost you money, but there is no other way out of it actually. Let me ask you a futuristic question then, if that is the only option. Now, finally, you know, we took, uh, we produce CO2 because of hydrocarbons. And your hydrocarbon came from Earth. Yes. And you are now saying that the product of this hydrocarbon burning, you'll go back to Earth under the ocean bed. Yes. Is there a way by whatever chemistry that we have let us say, leave it for 100 years, 200 years. The CO2 that you put in with water can make petrol, gasoline. 100, 200 years, probably not, because the temperature and pressure conditions you are talking about in nature is not that high. Obviously, the same experiment you are going to do in on Earth when we talk about utilization of CO2, no. So you, go down, you, go, you, deep, you go deep and you go, you get higher pressures, whatever. I'm saying, is there a natural way that using the geothermal uh, processes, is it possible to convert CO2 to hydrocarbons? Uh, Professor Pradeep, uh, I think people have not studied it, but I'll point it out, uh, point out one recent development in China. They have started digging a really long tunnel so that they can reach a place where there will be the right temperature and pressure conditions for all these reactions to happen. Thank you. I don't know whether they are going to do it for this, why okay. they are doing it, but then they are doing it. And I'm not sure what exactly is the intention for them to do it. But what you are asking now is exactly what is possible. You have the right temperature and pressure conditions. And if you are putting them there, it will react and it will produce something which you will be able to utilize if you really want to do that. That's a great thought. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, Thomas, you have something more. Yeah. Only, only one, uh, one last kind of question, comment, something in between, because this is what what you, Pradeep, just now asked about whether we can have a natural process that would convert these stocks somehow uh, stored in the ocean bed back into hydrocarbons. That's uh, that reminded me really of an important sentence uh, which Rainish mentioned at the very beginning when he was uh, commenting on uh, metal organic frameworks and all these sort of academic samples that are in terms of carbon dioxide uh, useless for this particular application. So that was very nice because then you, we have to look at very simple solutions that will be that that we can do without. Uh, it's it's obvious that no one can make in the next years tons of moths stable enough to tackle this problem so that that really reminded me of this uh when i hear we have to look at something that's naturally occurring or a process that is again naturally occurring that could also and my question about the economic aspects i didn't want to diminish the importance of the issue itself uh it's just that sometimes when i look at human society and how it works I have the feeling, unless there is an economical aspect, uh, people are somehow always 
willing to postpone the important issues for later if they don't see the economical return or some sort of an economical benefit. So I completely be... agree, Thomas, with you. And this is what is basically always what happens typically economics trumps everything else. And it is very unfortunate. And uh, I don't want to talk too much about, but people nowadays think everything is green. I will give you an example of green processes. People say that if you can produce it on earth, it is green. Not true. I'll tell you, in India, we buy one kilogram of sugar at half a dollar price. You know, half a dollar price. And I'll tell you the data, the sustainability of sugar production. 3,000 kilogram of water is consumed in producing one kilogram of sugar. Tell me, where is the cost? Are we really paying the cost which is we are polluting the environment? The 3,000 kilogram of water which you are going to use for producing one kilogram of sugar, you know, only 70%, only 30 percent of this water comes back on earth. Remaining 70 percent of water goes to the sea. Uh, so we, okay. we really don't cost count. Yeah, Pradeep, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, um, are there other questions? We should close this. Uh... Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I unfortunately Thank I you. get a little too much. I know you get uh, you get excited, and we all are excited. So, uh, we have there... a question in chat, yeah. sir. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, should I go to the chat? Yes, yes sir. Okay, let me. It was a great talk and then I have two questions. How do you assign Raman bands for large and small pores and CO2 captured eyes looks blue? Why? No, 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 no. CO2 captured eyes does not look blue. Unless until you have a thio uh, compound, thio gas there, it will not look blue. Uh, if you are mixing some thio compounds with your CO2 and forming hydrogen, it will look blue. Uh, so uh, second question is straightforward. It looks exactly like ice. You will not be able to differentiate a CO2 hydrate with ice physically by uh, looking at it. Exactly looks the same. There is no difference at all. Now, how do you assign Raman bands? Obviously, there are uh, literature data available. Uh, it's all about a stretching of C double bond O. C, uh, so all these uh, stretch bonds, you will be able to either calculate theoretically or you can basically get the data from literature and figure out where these uh, peak positions should be. And then you basically know that these are the peak positions which are for a stretch of CO. Did I answer your question? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the name. What is the name? Uh, Bothu Raju. Both Raju. Yeah, Bothu Raju. Yeah. Yes, Professor, I got it. Okay, yeah. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. I have one question. Yeah, go ahead, Kyuk. Go up. Yeah. So, sir, this is a curiosity based question. Is it possible to create CO2 structure to hydrate, pure CO2 structure to hydrate? If so, it is going to impact the cap, uh, capture capacity compared to structure one. Pure CO2 the structure two hydrate might form at a pressure which is probably uh, uh, very, very high. Means, uh, unfortunately, what happens when we talk about high pressure, it becomes liquid CO2. So you can form a structure to hydrate of liquid CO2 and water at a very high pressure. That has been shown, I guess, the one or two such papers are there. Okay. Sir. Very Thank energy you. intensive process. You should not be doing it, actually. If you are really looking for any scale-up process or any applied work, you should not be doing it. Okay. Sir. Better to form a structure to hydrate of CO2 by adding an additive, which forms by itself a structure to hydrate, and CO2 will occupy the remaining cages. Okay, sir. But, uh, thank you. So what I learned, I, I hope uh, this is the message. What I learned from this uh, talk was that there is no way to do anything without, without finding a mechanism to sequester, to have any process later on, we need to store it somewhere. And then we need to look at conversion ultimate conversion will be converting it to hydrocarbon themselves, but it is too far away. But that is that is something that all of you who are listening should probably look at. And if that can happen under geothermal conditions, wherever it is possible, that is the way forward for the planet. So Rajneesh, that talk was fantastic. All the very best to you. All of you, thank you very much for, for joining. Let's thank you, Professor Pradeep. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a good, week, good weekend, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Thomas. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Namakha. Nice talk. Very nice. Okay, Amog. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.